Thank you, Katerina. Uh, wonderful to be with you this afternoon. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Um, and it's fantastic to actually uh, share some of my thoughts uh, about what's happening uh, in the world right now. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity to see many good friends and to work with you, Katerina, and many other people. And I'd like to say thank you to the Four Seasons in Hong Kong because they've done a great things for me today to actually to be able to present from here and to share some of the um, the presentation from, from their rooms. Let me see if I can get you uh, uh, to share my screen. But before before I do that, I think everybody need, needs to recognize that this has been an extraordinary almost two years where we see the world changing and we see unprecedented challenges that we've got in many different places. And I think, if anything, uh, tourism has been strengthened because we have never seen before uh, so many governments and so many international organizations understanding the importance of tourism. And equally, we've never seen before a situation where tourists and the customers understand how important this experience is for them and what they should be doing. So now you should be able to see my presentation. If you can confirm that, Katerina. Yep. Thank you so much. So um, as, as Katerina said, I'm on sabbatical. In, I'm in Hong Kong Polytechnic University currently, uh, and I'm spending a, a year in Hong Kong, uh, working with colleagues here on a whole range of different uh, projects, smart projects that they are primarily focusing on uh, restarting tourism, looking to the governance and the management of tourism through technology and ambient intelligence, and looking to how we can take things forward um, to the next stage. And many of you will know that I'm primarily managing uh, the tourism review as a of chief, yes. and a lot of the new developments that are happening and a lot of the new things that are coming in, in uh, the, the development are coming through the best publications uh, that they are, uh, they are published in Tourism Review. I also, uh, the 400 uh, days that we're on lockdown, um, I spent a lot of time creating the Encyclopedia of Tourism Management and Marketing. And many of you were uh, contributing to that and hopefully we'll see this project coming into print in 2022. Many of you have been using material uh, already that is in, uh, on the website. And this is important because I'm constantly moving around and I'm meeting people here in Hong Kong, but also everywhere in the world. And I'm meeting a lot of people from destination management and I'm meeting a lot of people from hotel chains. I just had lunch with um, some very important um, uh, hotel managers. And I keep repeating to them, and they keep asking me uh, how we can bring academia and uh, industry together to address the major issues that we're facing globally in terms of how we are managing uh, tourism and how we'll be able to restart tourism. For those of you um, who have been following me on social media, you'll probably know that in order to come to Hong Kong, I had to have uh, three weeks of quarantine in a hotel room, plus nine PCR tests uh, on top of all the other regulations. So this is the situation that we're uh, facing and we need to learn um, to do all of these things ourselves. Let me see if I can play this video. Uh, I probably need to stop sharing for a minute. I know how to do this, hold on a second. Um, I need to to stop sharing for a minute. I'm not on my computer, so I need to learn how to do this on this computer. And then, because it's 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 a fantastic, actually I shouldn't have done that because it could, it could do it in a different way. Give me one second, I'll be back. Okay, I think I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stop with that. Uh, you're gonna, you're gonna see that in, in mute for a minute. And then you, you have the, the address there. So you can see it later on YouTube. Okay, it's a fantastic. It's I will a fantastic, post the link now, right now yeah. to the chat. It's a fantastic video. Just do it after I finish because everybody will be looking to the video and not listening to me, right? Um, so this is a fantastic video from Qantas. 
and so how important it is for all of us to travel. And I think it encapsulates the desire of people to travel and how important it is for all of us to travel. And so the um, people going away to get married, uh, people going back to Disneyland, and this is the father that he is going to, to go and meet his daughter. And, and I think that is an incredible kind of uh, thing. Now you should see the WTO uh, screen, Katerina. Can you confirm that? Yeah. So basically uh, what happened in 2020, we lost 74% of the global customers. And that meant that a lot of people in different places um, had no food, no tourists, no food. This is in Ubud. And a lot of places, even Hong Kong, you've got um, Stanley, you've got a lot of places where people are struggling to survive. You know, the conversations we have here is that if they, are no, if they have no tourists in Hong Kong, they need to rely on staycation. So they have to change totally their business models and they need to operate with the local market, which the local market um, is not traveling so much and, and that brought a whole range of different challenges. Now, this came yesterday from the barometer of the UNWTO and shows a recovery. It shows a slow recovery, but still recovery. And we see with vaccinations, we see with masks, we see with distances, we see with all the different things that we've, we've got some recovery. And that's really, really important. And I like to pay tribute to some people that they stood up and despite the challenges, they've done a fantastic job. So this is the Panas restaurant in the Southeast London that donated 100,000 meals to key workers during the pandemic. So this is a small restaurant that actually done that. And I think it really encapsulates the essence of solidarity, encapsulates how people need to raise to the challenge and rather than complain of what has happened to them, to look into how can they contribute to society and what is that they can offer to society given the difficult circumstances. I came very early and I talked about humanity, solidarity, leadership, and resilience. And I think those four words will see us through. And I think it's quite often people see me as um, the person who is gonna bring the technology and the technology is going to save them. But I think it's much more important to actually look into how those things are coming into tourism and what tourism can do to society rather than what society can do for tourism. And it's absolutely critical that we identify what can we do in tourism for humanity, for solidarity, for leadership and for resilience, and how we can go forward with that to develop tourism in the future. Now, of course, after, after any storm, there is a rainbow. And we had a couple of typhoons here in Hong Kong the last, in the last two days. And, and uh, we always know what's happening uh, uh, afterwards. And we're very blessed in tourism because we can reignite tourism because the assets in terms of the products, the branding, the co-creation, and the experience are still there. So the local residents can work with um, the tourists to co-create experiences based on differentiation and authenticity. But I think the conversation I'm having with a lot of people in industry all over the world is that we should not look to the past. We should look forward. And one of the conversations I just had was things like yield management and revenue management, right? We are always looking what has happened in the last two uh, Octobers, the, the last three Octobers. But in fact, what happened in the last three Octobers may be relevant to what's gonna happen in the future. So we really need to start looking into how we can use big data and smartness and agility to go forward. And we, what we see everywhere is the end of planning and the beginning of the agility. The end of planning because normally um, we'll have a year planning, yearly planning, and we'll have a long term of three to four years planning. But now we've seen that everything changing so fast that we need to be much more agile and the long-term planning became a couple of weeks. So that is changing the way we operate. And in order to operate with resilience, we need to be smart and we need to be agile. And of course, all you want is Greece. And I would say that, wouldn't I? But um, 
it's it, it looks like those places that they've been quite good in in being um, proactive and reactive and manage proactively their resources and reactively to the situations they've been winning, uh, especially during the crisis period, and they've improved their resilience. Greece is one of these examples that was quite good at managing the risk and, and operating with the different stakeholders in a way that they can produce um, appropriate services. And, and a lot of people went forward to that. So when you're looking to smart tourism, I think we really need to go a little bit back to basics and lo look into competitive advantage, destination differentiation, enhancement of reputation, and developing new business models based on innovation and investment that they're taking advantage of, of the resources that we have and they optimize the resources we have got in order to benefit residents. And this is based on a paper I've done more than 20 years ago, but I'm still surprised how many destinations are not necessarily understanding these things and how we need to go back to basics and understand what we're trying to do with that. And this is something I've done um, in the last year as the introduction to the encyclopedia, and you can find this online, and it's called the tourism pyramid because the tourism pyramid will be the basis of doing tourism everywhere. So we've got a tourism system that was uh, that emerged from Neil Lipia, and we've got here the generating region and the destination region. And then you have got the transit region where you've got the remediation and omni-channel management. You've got information technologies and communications. You've got transportation and accessibility. All those things are bridging the demand on the one side and the supply on the other side. And of course, you've got resources coming in and you've got coming a uh, value coming out. So this is the value system and the tourism system as we know. But I think we need to understand that the, um, the tourism system is on top of the pyramid and the pyramid requires agile planning and management and towards strategic management. It needs a very good understanding of the market forces and how markets uh, generate things and they can change things very quickly. Exogenous variables where you have got a range of different variables that they determine what we do in tourism. And obviously uh, COVID is an exogenous variable that has screwed up everything else we're doing. And then you've got the technologies and the infrastructure that is coming into, into um, the situation to actually provide the, the basis for the development of, of, um, of, of the tourism activity and uh, for bridging the, the demand and the supply. It's absolutely critical that we understand holistically how tourism works. And I think I spent quite a lot of time doing that. And after, after uh, reading the 1,250 entries of the encyclopedia and the 2 million words that they went in there, I think this encapsulates the whole tourism system and how we need to be um, doing tourism sustainably in the future. Smartness takes advantage of the interoperability and interconnectivity of integrated technologies to re-engineer process and data in order to produce value for the entire range of the stakeholders. And that re-engineering will enable shaping products, actions, processes, and services in real time in engaging with different stakeholders simultaneously to optimize the, co the collective performance and competitiveness and generate agile solutions and value for everybody involved. Now, we need this um, value to be sustainable, and we need to engage with the different stakeholders that what we do uh, maximize the, 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 the welfare of um, societies on the long term. And, and I think smartness will enable us to understand the big data that's going behind everything and, and, and help us create networks that are interoperable and interconnected using all kinds of technologies from the internet of things, internet of everything, sensors, beacons, and, and analyze big data in order to provide this value uh, co-creation platforms that will enable everybody to collaborate and create those things. Smartness is not about technology. A lot of people think that smartness is technology or digitization. It's much more than that because it brings all the different stakeholders together and brings the evolution through um, the different uh, technologies 
together to, to create real-time dynamic adaptive, customized, individualized, and contextualized solutions uh, for all the stakeholders. And we need to understand the consumers, and this is something we've done with Daisy Fun to look into how consumers, when they move into destinations, how do they communicate with the local communities and also with everybody else in their, in their social circle. And we've seen that the consumers, as they are moving, they've got face-to-face -face social contacts, and also they've got online social contacts, and they're constantly communicating with everybody. So I'm currently at the Four Seasons. I, I just had meeting with several people. And then, um, uh, and then at the same time, I was communicating through my mobile phone with a whole range of people, partly with the organizers of this, of this conference with Katerina and different people, Elena, and, but, but also I was talking to friends um, for organizing things for this evening and for different things. So what, what we have is a consumer that's moving into this, um, hybrid environment where they've got offline and off offline communications dynamically in order to be able to uh, to move forward. And, and of course, we have seen that different types of consumers operate on these things in a very different way. So we've created a, a typology of consumers to look into those people who can work in online environments, those people who prefer to work on offline environments, and those other uh, combination of those things. So we, once we understand what consumers would like to do, then we can have smart solutions for them to actually address their needs and their uh, personal preference. I talk about uh, big data and big data empower agility. Uh, and especially in volatile and time sensitive industries like tourism, where we need to know so many things in order to be able to manage the big data in order to be able to manage all the different parameters that are coming into the context in order to, in order to, to create value. So in this paper, we've identified the different concepts and categories that are coming as input on big data towards co-creating agile solutions. <clears throat> and of course, there's, there'll be a lot of smart solutions that I wouldn't uh, have the time right now to, to talk about, but things like the autonomous vehicles and the drones and uh, robotics and artificial intelligence and big data uh, and all of those things are coming together to actually manage tourism in real time. And real time agility is something and ambient intelligence is, is things that they're going to bring, um, bring us forward. And I've, I've created the, the concept of nowness. And nowness is, is when you are looking to uh, all the different bits of the context, including the location base, the mentions, the hashtags, the sentiment analysis, the trending topics, the keyword tracking, the competitors, and all of those things that are happening in real time. And you understand, where am I now? What am I doing? What is my needs? And how can I address my needs? And I think this is, this is really critical in, in co-creating value, and especially in places where you've got natural environments that they need special care. Because if you understand the nature of the special care that the natural environments require, then you create solutions that are addressing um, the conditions in that particular context. So for example, in Greece, you've got careta careta turtles that for a period of time, uh, they're reproducing. So you really need to be very careful for that period of time on what you're doing on the beach. But in other places, there may be different sensitivities. And so you, what you need to do is you need to address the sensitivities in different places at different times and understand what is the context now and why is that critical? I think when you look at it from a tourist management marketing point of view, you understand that nowness is driven, is data driven, it's consumer centric, it enhances experiences in real time and supports co-creation. And it does that by driving instant gratification. Now, traditionally on strategic management, you have got price differentiation or, uh, or uh, product differentiation. Increasingly, you see real time differentiation that drives instant gratification. So understanding the local conditions in real time will be really, really difficult on what we're doing. Uh, and I can see colleagues from China here. China is closed for tourists. You cannot have external, external uh, people traveling to China because you have got 
uh, first of all, you don't get visas as a tourist to go to China right now. And uh, the restrictions are changing dramatically. I think what, and, and we had situations where colleagues were in China, they went to Macau. So when they come into, into Hong Kong, they wouldn't have the, um, uh, the days of the quarantine required. And then they went to Hong Kong and then the regulation changed in, the, in Hong Kong. So what, what, what we need to do, particularly in this challenging environment, is understand how we should address the context as the, as the context is changing through the dynamic kind of situation. Now, what we have identified with uh, Jagen Sinarta is, is looking to what really triggers real-time contextual changes. And then looking to contextual relevance of what's happening, going through the noun circle and create real-time service enablers towards co-creating value for all the stakeholders. And I think the critical bit is to understand what is happening here towards understanding what's happening here in terms of value. So a couple of days ago, I was about to go out of my hotel and um, to go and meet some friends. And, and the concierge said, you cannot go out because it's a typhoon. And I said, don't worry, I'm going to take the bus and I'm going to go. I said, the buses are not going. The buses have stopped operating. Um, so what we need to understand is what is the contextual information and what opportunities and challenges that brings for different people. And of course, we have got ambient intelligence where we've got smart systems that in everyday environments um, that they are hiding at the background uh, through the internet of everything. And those will be supported by artificial intelligence, machine learning, ambient connectivity through wide area, Wi-Fi, 5G, autonomous vehicles and robotics. All of those things will be coming together towards facilitating the management and marketing of tourism. Because when you've got technology on everything and you understand what's happening in every single place, then you can manage the place holistically and you can look into what value can you add holistically in different places. And here you've got consumers in the middle. So you've got customer centricity that is driven by the internet of things and internet of everything, by 5G and different forms of connectivity, RFID, mobile devices, uh, smartphones, wearables, um, cryptocurrencies and blockchains, sensors and beacons, pervasive computing, gamification, and artificial intelligence and machine learning. I think all of those things are coming together. And what we see is a lot of robots coming into, and a lot of technology coming into what we do. This is uh, probably two years ago in the New Century Grand Hotel in Hangzhou when uh, I became friend, uh, friends with this robot that was uh, following me around, and um, uh, it was quite fun to actually see uh, how those things work. Now, I know I, I packed a lot of information on, on this. This uh, a range of publications that we've done in the last four or five years that support all the things that I've been talking about, and I, I encourage you to have a look. Uh, because you can see all the different bits on there. And there's uh, the gamification book that we just brought out with Fei Fei Zhu on, on gamification for tourism that looks into how you can take advantage of gamification for supporting a lot of the things that we said, value co-creation, uh, real-time agile um, uh, uh, product uh, development and, um, and value for consumers. Thank you very much. And I'll leave you with this slide so you've got my contact details and I'll be more than happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Demetrius. Uh, it was really exciting, interesting. So, uh, and thanks for fantastic time management. So we have really enough time for the questions. So if anyone would like to ask, clarify anything, please feel free either to type your question in the chat and I'll, I will forward it to Demetrius or feel free to unmute yourself probably before by raising your hand so we don't talk all together. Meanwhile, while we're waiting for the first questions, uh, as you can see, we are recording this keynote session, so we will share it online with you for those who want to uh, have a look once again, for those who want to catch up with the most um, uh, recent 
yeah, publications in the topic of smart tourism. Um, we have a first question. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot see the whole surname. Uh, I can see name Sophie. Yes, sir. Um, I have a question because he, um, um, Dimitrios was um, talking about um, different knowledge from different um, business area. And I was wondering if um, one way of mixing tourism with um, new technologies, um, especially when we are talking about um, slow tourism, environment and so on, um, some places like um, hotels or um, places where you can have, um, um, or you, you can enjoy yourself, could um, be a place where you can learn how to use um, new and future technology to, um, to save the environment, for example, to save water or, or to, to learn how to cook a new way um, of cooking to save um, um, products and vegetables and fruit and so on. And if that could happen, how could it be? Because I think that um, we need to be taught um, new things for the, to pre to prepare the future and to um, uh, to save um, the environment as well. But we need to learn how to you to do that with the best um, um, the best the best people and the best um, research. Um, so um, holidays sure. and sure. I, th I think so. I think I think that's an interesting question, Sophie. In a way what we need to do is educate people when they're going through um, the tourism destinations and the different resources about the resources they've, they've the resources they consume and make yeah. them aware of their environmental footprint and i think technology is very important on all those things for measuring things so we need to measure for example how much water you are spending on your shower and to compare it with someone else who is uh, the local population. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to look into what is your environmental footprint. And also we need to, uh, we can project, you know, if you're going hiking, where are you going to go hiking and what your impact will be? Uh, in the sense that, you know, there are, there are areas that they are of environmental concern and they've got environmental um, um, sensitivities while other areas may not be. So I think you're right. We, as part of the travel experience, we will be in a way able to educate people and support people to engage with their environment and see what can they return back to society. And, and not only, I mean, a lot of people are talking about sustainability and they're only talking about the environment and natural resources. But also don't forget that there are social resources, sustainability, economic resource sustainability. So we need to look into holistically into sustainability and we also need to uh, use technology to make sure that people familiarize themselves with their footprint and their yeah. impacts and also engaging them into how they can make a contribution to society. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, now we start getting lots of questions actually. Uh, so people are waking up. Um, so the next question is from uh, Michelle Cummings Cursor. Uh, how, do, how do you think smart tourism will affect human communication and interaction in customer service? Hopefully for a better way. Um, we assume that people can communicate nicely uh face to face in fact i went yesterday to a chinese restaurant uh local um which opened a few days ago and in fact i couldn't communicate with the waitress uh and the, the menu was in chinese in, in cantonese um so the only way to do it was to download uh, an application to translate the menu on my on my app and point out to the lady what i want to eat so um I, th I think it's uh, a, a, a myth that humans communicate better than um, 
um, uh, uh, face to face rather than with technology. And I think what we need to do is you, we need to use smart technologies to support uh, operational services like why do I need to go to a reception to get the key to get into my room? I can get the key easily or I can get the code. Um, that is functional bits. And then we need to use technology in a smart way to understand how we can protect customers when they're traveling. So Buchalis does not go out on the typhoon because he's going to be killed. And, and also opening up um, the cultural elements and the natural elements, like Sophie was saying early on, that if you're here, when you turn left and right, you'll find this fantastic um, uh, um, environmental resource that you didn't know about, or you'll find this community that uh, you may like to be involved in one way or another. So smartness enables a, a much smarter way of doing tourism. Let's face it, uh, we haven't done smart tourism uh, properly. We haven't done tourism properly for a long time. And actually, I'm getting really, really angry when I hear people talking about over tourism because they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, it's badly managed tourism rather than, uh, rather than a problem of, of, of volume. So we really need to understand capacity management. We really need to understand what are the, the resource implications. We need to understand what is the sustainability implications on everything we do. And we need to engage with consumers in a smart way to make them part, to make them aware of their impact and also to give them the tools to communicate. So I wouldn't be able to order, which I thought, I, I still don't know what I was eating last night. I, th I think it was kind of chicken satay, uh, grilled chicken kind of sticks, uh, but I'm not 100% I'm not sure, but that's, but that's what the technology said. Uh, but with, without the technology, I wouldn't be able to order and I wouldn't be able to function. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the next logical question comes from Brian Breidenbach. So does artificial mm. intelligence or smart tourism technology threaten tourism authenticity? What do you think? Um, mm, that's an interesting one. Um, first of all, what is authenticity? And do we assume that people like authentic things? Um, who told you that people like authentic things? If I give you authentic Chinese food, you're not going to be able to eat it. It's chicken feet. Okay. If I take you to a chicken fight in Indonesia, you're not going to be able to see it because it's, it's, it's very brutal. And if I take you to a bullfight in, in Spain, you'll hate it. Um, so there's another myth that people like authentic things. People do not like authentic things. People think like the things that they think are authentic. So that's number one. Number two is what we're trying to do with um, technology um, is trying to bring the demand and the supply closer together, okay? And we are trying to bring what you can enjoy and what you are really looking for to what is on offer out there. And we create the bridges. Now, artificial intelligence means that we learn through machine learning patterns of behavior. So if we know that every time that you go to China, you are looking for the best chicken feet, will bring you closer to this authentic experience. But if we know that you are looking for Beijing um, a duck, we're going to bring you to this kind of um, experience. And if you go to Germany, um, we may say that if you are like uh, Beijing a duck, you may like this kind of food, you know, um, pork in Germany, whatever. So what we are trying to do is we're trying to understand patterns of behavior and facilitate that kind of connectivity between, between different things and artificial intelligence and smartness is really about um, bringing the resources together and creating the bridges and connecting the dots in a way that it's easier uh, for people to co-create value. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, really in-depth perspective. We have one more question. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I cannot see the whole name. Uh, probably Mr. Badari. Please feel free to unmute yourself. Oh, well, thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, well, uh, Professor, I, I have a question. Uh, now, uh, you know that we have seen that how pandemic has really affected the tourism industry. Okay, well, now since the situation has come back almost to normal, now, 
at, when we are trying to encourage people to travel, how do we apply the caring capacity? When, uh, you know, at the same time, we can see that uh, the place cannot hold a, a number of people in a day. So what will be the role of the stakeholder here? But Derek, how long have you got? <laughs> I, can, I can answer, that's a lecture and a half. That's a very interesting question. First of all, let's start with what's current capacity and who defines current capacity, because current capacity for the Chinese that I meet here in Hong Kong is very different from the people in, in Germany or the people in Finland. You know, current capacity in Finland may be two people in two square miles, where here it's about uh, 200,000 people in two square miles. Okay, so it's a very subjective kind of subject. So we need to look into what's the current capacity for each perception. And it's also looking into what is the use of the space? How do we use the space? Um, so quite often, the current capacity uh, discussion remains very superficial because it's only looking to how many people are arriving into a place uh, per year in comparison to how many people are the local residents. So these kind of measures uh, are quite superficial. So when you're looking to, for example, Santorini in Greece and you see how many people are going there, you really need to understand what's the patterns of the people who are going there. So quite often they are telling me there's over tourism in Santorini. I said, hold on a second, let me understand what's happening. Uh, and then they say, look, when the three cruise ships arrive at the same time, yeah, of course, then you've got 8,000 people trying to go to the small streets of Sandorini and mm -hmm. the beautiful views of Sandorini at the same time. So you reach current capacity at no time. So I think, I said from the beginning, we need to go back to resource management and understand management and planning of, of, of destinations. And if you remember on the pyramid, I said, we really need agile, management of resources and there is not one one uh, area for everywhere where are you where are you from badari where are you where are you connecting from uh well sir i am uh, i'm from india and i belong okay. to the northeastern part of india okay again you really need to understand your locality and you need to understand what is acceptable in your locality and you need to understand what are the conditions of of production of tourism and once you understand that, then you start engaging with the different stakeholders. Now, I think eventually what you need to do is you need to find a way of reaching agreement between the different stakeholders. And that's a difficult bit because yes. uh, reaching agreement between the, the different stakeholders that have got different interests, it's quite complex because quite often your interests against mine, right? So I may like to sell a lot of tourists coming to my area, but you like to have very few. But I think somehow um, the government, the politician, the planning authorities need to come together and agree those things and, and have an understanding that unless you have got a situation where agreement can be reached, then people are not gonna have a, pleasure, a, a pleasurable experience. They're not gonna have a transformational experience as far as consumers are concerned and the local guys are not going to be happy. And then this is a short term um, uh, uh, tourism uh, development kind of planning, because what's going to happen is that there are going to be conflicts. And the minute that you've got conflicts between locals and tourists, that's the end of the tourism industry. Because people do not, do not like to go into places that they're creating um, uh, conflict. I think this is the opportunity for the researchers to come forward and those of you who are doing research in tourism, you really need to look into your locality and understand what are the different interests, what are the sensitivities, what's the sustainability issues, what are the things that we really need to look at, and what are the, the, the critical indicators. So people are saying to me, what smartness can do for you? But I say, what are the indicators that you are looking at? What are the bits that you really want to measure to predict what's going to happen? and then create the rules. So if we say that out of this, in this park, we don't want more than 2000 people, how can we have the sensors in the place to understand what's gonna happen? How can we predict based on previous behavior, based on weather, based on public holidays, based on a whole range of things? And how can we predict what's gonna happen? And how can we create alternative experiences 
if we experiencing a high level of demand. So it's really about understanding the sensitivities, understanding what strategic objectives you've got through planning and management and engaging with the different players on creating solutions that they are co-creating value for everybody. Thank you very much, sir. I mean, that has really bring light to the question. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste, Thank sir. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm delighted to see that, that uh, actually in the chat, we already started having uh, a discussion about that. So the, the next question is, yes, we know that, uh, and we, we, we have just discussed, Dimitrius, you have just highlighted how uh, smart tourism can potentially create these more sustainable, environmentally friendly, sustainable businesses, sustainable destination and management. So how can this happen? How can these all opportunities reach businesses? For example, hotel real estate development, uh, cruise liners, um, how to communicate this? They're stakeholders, they need to be around the table. They need to be around the table and they need to be part of the agreement. And we, you know, everybody, the, the conversation I had just before lunch was really about how can we take advantage of the situation we've got and how the context is changing our situation. I think the, I think the most critical thing is bring everybody, all the stakeholders around the table and start planning. And you may say to the cruise operators, okay, you're not gonna go into Venice but I'm going to create an alternative um, port for you where, and then I'm gonna facilitate the transportation in order to co-create value for everybody who is involved. So it's not us and them. You know, what I hear a lot in sustainability conference and people on greening is things that they are totally unrealistic. And it's basically, they are very patronizing in the sense that we would like everybody else to do what we would like everybody else to do. But that's not what's going to happen. What needs to happen is connecting the different stakeholders and agree a, 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 a way forward that maximizes the benefits and the value for everybody on the longer term. That's what sustainability is about. It's not about preserving environment. It's not about preserving cultures. It's not about preserving economies. It's about doing all of these things in the best possible way. Thanks. And there is actually a question from uh, Mikhail Angel in the chat. So sh should this happen right now during this pandemic time? Should these uh, links between smartness, sustainability, green practices happen urgently around the world right now? Or of should course. it be more uh, slow evolution? I think, I think everything needs to happen yesterday. I'm very impatient for those of you who know me. Um, but but I, think, I think the pandemic gave us an opportunity to actually pause for a minute and think very carefully what we want. But be very, very careful with what's happening. What, what was happening is that all the sustainability people came up and they start saying, okay, we had a lot of tourists before, that's a, a fantastic opportunity to kick the tourists out. And um, we didn't like over tourism, so we need to have under tourism. So God gave them all the under tourism of the world and they said, deal with under tourism now and come back and, and tell me what you really want. And I think it's critical to understand that we really need agreement around the table in the long term. The time is now, the time, the time was yesterday and the time is now to come, come around and, and have a discussion. Having said that, I think we, recognize, we need to recognize a couple of things. I think a lot of societies around the world, they are absolutely desperate to bring tourists back. And I hear from colleagues in Bali, in Kenya, in Spain, in Portugal, in, in Chile, everywhere in the world. And they say, professor, please bring us tourists back. And that will create the opposite pressure. And the pressure will be, let's go, let's go back to um, as, as many people as possible. And I think that's a reality because people are getting hungry. I was on the Greek islands this summer and and people were relieved to see tourists back because if you don't understand it, uh, and many people in academia do not necessarily understand what is the, the issues in, in the industry, 
um, you find that people are desperate to bring money back and to be uh, to bring their livelihood back. So it's a little bit of of, of difficult time to actually uh, contain people, but also I think it's the most important time that we come around the table and we have agreement. Because if we don't do it now, there's not no better time to do it. We need to bring everybody around the table now and 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 have a conversation and agree what we would like to do because. In a way, tourism has posed, and we have the opportunity to do it now. Uh, having said that, what we see in places where they reopening, especially in China, where they reopen in domestic tourism, is that there is what we call tourism revenge. So people are going back to do double the traveling that they were doing before, uh, because after so many months of 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 being enclosed to, to, to places, you really want to, to, to recover some of this time. And it's not only for less of travel, don't forget that people are traveling for visiting for friends, families, um, uh, they've got business trips, you've got all kinds of travel. So there'll be a rebound of travel that my prediction will be much, much stronger. And I think that's an opportunity to actually engage in conversations now to create limits, create strategies, policies, in order to um, make sure that the value is co-created for everybody. Thank you. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And we have the time for the last, last question. I think, uh, yeah, we have one uh, uh, hand raised from uh, Infinix hot number six. I love your name, Infinix hot number six. Please unmute yourself and ask the question. <clears throat> we cannot hear you uh, in Phoenix and we can hear you, Sophie. So I think we've got a problem here. Um, I'm, I'm Sophie. If I can ask my question again. Um, um, regarding what you just said, uh, among uh, all the stakeholders, who, um, who do you think has the real power to bring um, everyone around the table um, uh, about the question um, about recovery and how to get um, an agreement on how it, to deal with uh, the new COVID organization of tourism? To, it, depends uh, on your, it depends on your location, Sophie. In some mm, places, great it's Britain. governments. In some places, it's governments. In some other places, it's much more participatory. In Great Britain, you have got um, local authorities that they are that they are bringing together uh, development um, uh, development plans, and they bring all the stakeholders together. But but the local councils and the regional councils are in a, in a way empowered in the UK. Okay. okay. Thank you very in Phoenix, much. Thank you. In Phoenix, do you still have the question? We cannot hear you. Please type it and Katerina was, is going to relate. No. So, but unfortunately we are running out of time. It was fantastic to, to have almost 25, almost 30 minutes of Q&A. Thank you very much, Demetrius, for that. Uh, if every, anyone has questions, uh, please feel free to uh, get in touch with Demetrius. He is in social media. He is in social media. I'm sorry, there was some technical issue. Sorry, there was some technical issue. All right. So um, at this point, yes. unfortunately, we have to. At switch. this point, unfortunately, we have to switch to to the next sessions. To the next sessions. Demetrius, thank you so much. Demetrius, we wish you fantastic experience in Hong Kong. Kong. Hopefully no typhoons anymore. Dear guests, I would like to invite you now to the next session. Um, so I will just try to briefly introduce you. So we have really interesting program and now you have opportunities to either join the Resilience Auditorium, where uh, we will have the first, our keynote, Transformational Processes to More Sustainable Tourism. 
or if you are interested in a traditional knowledge in management of natural environment, please, you're very welcome at Innovation Auditorium, or feel free to join one of our um, research tracks related to tourism in general, to nature-based tourism, and to health tourism. They are in Vitality Hall, in Destination Earth Hall, and Sustainability Hall. I um, hope that you enjoy the program. See you soon.